Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Lina Caballero. I'm a, a, a Colombian scientist. I'm immigrant and I'm mother in science. I'm very happy to um, make this last symposium about diversity and inclusion in STEAM. How do we move from theory to practice? Um, now I'm very happy and I'm pleased to introduce you to uh, the Professor Fernanda Stanisławski. She is a um, professor of, uh, at Universidad Federal do Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, and she is the leader of the movement uh, Pioneer Science in Latin America. And I'm very happy that Fernanda is here today. Then Fernanda, thank you. Um, please, can you uh, <laughs> come with this uh, wonderful talk? Okay, so I want to talk today about the parenting science movement. There is a, mov a movement we founded here in Brazil to discuss about parenting in academia and in science. Uh, I'm going to present to you a little bit of our, our, movement, of our movement, and I want to talk more about what were the actions that we have performed here in Brazil? What were our achievements here in Brazil uh, regarding uh, structural changes in our system that is, uh, that were quite important for us to have some uh, equality in when we are talking about gender in science and specifically about mothers in science. So our movement was founded in 2016. At the beginning, we were just seven researchers uh, from the south of Brazil, and we decided to do something about the uh, challenges we were having in conciliating our recent motherhood and our recent uh, position as a professor in the university. So we were just establishing, establishing ourselves in the university. Uh, we decided to have children, and then things change uh, a lot. So. Uh, at that time in 2016, we didn't see anyone talking about what happens when you have children and you are a scientist, what happens uh, with your career or anything. So we decided to start the movement to talk about it and to promote change because there is a misconception that we have to choose between motherhood and a career in science or in academia. academia. And that is not true. What we need is support. And that can happen in a lot of different instances. And that's what I'm going to talk to you. So here are the group that started the movement with me. Uh, we had a lot of changes during this last five years. We have a big um, uh, improvement in our team. So today we are a group of 90 uh, science from all, Brazil, all the Brazilian regions. And we are all engaged in this fight to change how we see uh, parenthood, more specifically motherhood in, in academia. So now we are organizing pods. We have the central pod, that is the movement coordination. Uh, we are now 18 scientists in this pod. And we also have our ambassadors um, program. We have now 72 ambassadors from uh, 50, 53 different institutions. Uh, in all five regions in Brazil from different uh, 18 different states. So this program, the ambassadors program was really important for us. So we have people from all places bring their reality and talking about uh, what the specific things that happens uh, in their environment and everything. So uh, we have made a lot of progress uh, when we are talking about parenthood in science in here in Brazil. And I'm gonna present to you a few things because I wanna try uh, to answer the question that was left in our uh, section title that's how we move from a theory to practice. So I'm gonna uh, tell a little bit about uh, our actions here in Brazil. So it's quite important to think that uh, we have actions uh, effective actions related to motherhood in science, but that is based in data. So here we are trying to develop support policies based on data that we, that we have raised over these five years of our movement here in Brazil. So the first thing we had 
as a barrier to try to talk to our funding agencies and our institutions about uh, creating support policies uh, to mothers in science. It was because we didn't have any data to show what was the real impact that the scientists suffered uh, when the children arrive or anything. So the first thing we have done here in Brazil was a survey. Uh, the survey was conducted uh, during 2017 and 2018. Uh, the survey was uh, answered by close to 3,000 scientists. We have a lot of data. I'm not going to present everything, but one that was really important is that here, uh, when we analyze the publication records uh, for mothers, and this uh, bar in the middle of the graph represents the, the, the arrival of the first uh, child. We see in all knowledge areas, there is a drop in the publication records. This drop lasts several years and it's not supposed to be like that. So the first year or so it's natural that we see a drop on productivity because of the maternal uh, maternity leave and everything. But the lack of support policies make this effect uh, last longer. So with this data, we were able to implement a lot of actions here in Brazil. One of the main things we wanted and showing the data was quite important for us to get is that maternity is recognized as part of our career. We try to hide uh, our maternity, our motherhood uh, for too long and, and that wasn't working. So we decided to make clear that uh, motherhood is part of, part of our career. So uh, here in Brazil, we have a national CV database that is called the LATS platform. Uh, is run by one of our funding agencies. Uh, and now it counts to close to 7 million CVs that are registered in this platform. So what you wanted is that the platform uh, had a specific field so we can inform the maternity leave periods. The aim of this field is to justify the drop in productivity that we know it happens and to show there is not just uh, a, a lack of productivity is something that is natural to occur. So uh, the request was made in 2018 and it took over two years. So the funding agency finally implemented the maternity leave uh, field in the CV database here in Brazil. It took a lot of fight to, uh, in order to implement that. So we had a lot of campaigns. We have our shirts with our kids name on, uh, on CV data. Um, to try to promote this discussion. So in April uh, 15 of this year, uh, CNPq, that is the funding agency that runs the last uh, platform, uh, installed, the, uh, installed this, uh, this specific field. So you can see here on, on your right, um, now my CV has uh, three licenses, um, three maternity leave period information in there. But there is not, um, it doesn't change anything if we just have the information there and this information is not used in any way. So one of the main things we were able to achieve here in Brazil is that several of our funding agencies and institutions have uh, included uh, what we call a maternity clause in their funding grants, fellowship application, selection, uh, hiring progression. All the processes that involve CV analysis now have this clause. What does this, this clause mean? Here in Brazil, usually what is analyzed is what this scientist has produced in, uh, for, uh, in the last five to 10 years. So for scientists that were in maternal leave, we expand this period looking at seven or 12 years. So if the science is productive prior to the, to the leave, uh, we can try to compensate the gap that happens after uh, we became mothers. Or we are also using a correction factor. So we have a, a, a punctuation on our CVs and then at the end, these uh, points are corrected by a factor of 1.1, 1.5. It depends on uh, the, uh, the call uh, in each of the agencies or institutions. So there is a major, major win for, for us here because it translates the theory. We show the data showing that there is a gap in productivity due to the maternity leave into practice. We were able to establish uh, rules that support mothers 
uh, when they are competing for grants or fellowships or a position at the university or a spot on the graduate uh, program or anything. So other than that, we were working in several things and then we were hit by the pandemic. And that meant a lot of changes in our uh, situation here in Brazil and everywhere, especially regarding for um, our child care. So here in Brazil, in the middle of March of 2020, all these schools and daycares, they were closed due to the pandemic. And then our universities after, uh, soon after, after, uh, after also adopted the uh, remote teaching uh, regime. So we were worried what was going to happen with all these scientists uh, mothers trying to keep on with, the, with their careers while taking care of children at home, taking care of children education from home and everything. So in May of 2020, we published this letter in Science talking about the impact of COVID on academic mothers. And we also have the performed the survey here in Brazil. The survey was uh, answered for more than 14,000 scientists. We were able to generate a lot of data uh, of, on what was happening with scientists uh, during the pandemic regarding uh, submission of manuscripts, uh, publications, the ability to meet deadlines for grant applications, fellowships, and everything. So. Uh, this year, we published some of this, the results from the survey on frontiers of psychology, uh, where we analyzed the data from uh, over 3,000 Brazilian scientists, and we look at only professors and researchers that were already hired in, uh, in our institutions here in Brazil. And we evaluated how gender, race, and parenthood had impacted the academic productivity during the isolation period um, here in Brazil. So the survey was conducted in April and May of last year and the data reflects what was happening at, at that period of time. So what we saw, I'm not gonna show everything, you can uh, take a look at our paper, but when we were talking about submitting papers and that was, was the main thing that was being talked about in the academic community, a lot of uh, publishers and editors were saying that women were submitting much more much less uh, papers than men and everything. So we asked the science here in Brazil if they had a paper to be submitted during, during the isolation uh, period. And from those that had a paper to submit, we asked, if, we asked if they were able to. And there is a big gender effect. So close to 70% of men said they were able to submit papers as they planned it but only 50% of women were able to submit papers. Uh, they were already in a, a submission phase. Uh, when we start to look at the intersections with the gender as parenthood and race, we see uh, a big effect. So here we have a huge difference between uh, parents, uh, between fathers and mothers. So there almost, there is no difference uh, between uh, males uh, and males with children, but there is a, a big difference between fathers and mothers. Uh, also, what is really shocking for us was to see that even women without children, they were submitting much less papers than men without children. This, this happens because the pandemic has not only exacerbated the child care uh, bearing that women uh, hold here in Brazil and everywhere, but all the domestic labor, all the unpaid caring uh, labor, uh, it's usually performed by uh, women. So we can see this difference, even uh, for women that do not have children. Another major uh, factor that influenced productivity during the COVID pandemic was race. So here in Brazil, over half of our population declared themselves as Black people. But in, acad uh, in academia and in science, we have a really low participation of uh, Black people, especially women. In our grad uh, programs, we have less than 3% of professors there are uh, Black females. So we have a really huge problem uh, regarding race here in Brazil. And we show that here too, that uh, there is a difference between the submission of articles between uh, female uh, white and black females, 
And what was more shocking for us is that uh, there is no difference between uh, black females without children and females with or uh, white or black females uh, with children. That just reinforces for us that there is um, a big issue with racism here in Brazil. We have women uh, that relate that are suffering from uh, professional isolation here in Brazil and everything. So our data just reinforces what we already knew. But it was quite important to bring numbers to this discussion because we were able to do some recommendations for our funding agencies and our institutions and how to deal with the pandemic if we do not want to uh, cause any setbacks in all the events we have here in Brazil uh, regarding gender and race in science. So one of the main recommendations we made to our funding agencies and institutions was the flexibility of deadline. In the report, we, were, we asked people if they were able to, uh, to meet deadlines for anything, grants, fellowships, whatever. Uh, and there was a big difference in gender. And also there is a big difference in people that took advantage of uh, extension of deadlines. So we recommended that all possible deadlines will be postponed, increased in times for submission and everything. Also, we are trying to uh, fight for grants, specific grants that are aimed at the most affected groups, meaning women, especially black women and uh, mothers. It's quite different, uh, it's quite difficult here in Brazil today because uh, funding of our science is, is being suffering a lot of cuts. So we don't have a lot of money. Uh, and it's quite hard to argue that we needed a specific funding for this group of people, but there is a, a really stronger recommendation that we think about it to support these uh, women, Black women, and especially mothers, uh, to be able to restore their career after the pandemic. We are still uh, discussing how we're going to analyze CVs from now on. We don't, we can, we cannot uh, assume that 2020 or 2021 will be regular years. So we need to assess longer periods of times for promotions or uh, for any kind of competition that takes a CV into account because we need to dilute these moments of low productivity that we know is happening with the, the pandemic. Here in Brazil, we are far from being over the pandemic, so it's still a very important policy to be uh, implemented. In our institutions, we are fighting for family-friendly meeting hours, the redistribution when possible of teaching loads in administ administrative uh, activities, because we still have a lot of schools and daycares in some cities is still closed. We still don't have all our support, support system being working. Uh, so we're still fighting for that, that our institutions have to um, be flexible uh, between uh, when we are doing these meetings, we still have children that are being homeschooled and everything. So we need to consider that when we are scheduling our uh, activities in the university. Uh, we also had a lot of data uh, regarding uh, our grad students during the pandemic. And one thing that was really shocking for us that we asked these students, and we have almost 10,000 graduate students that reply, that answer our survey. We asked who was able to continue their work on their thesis or dissertation during the pandemic and the social isolation period. And it was quite shocking for us, the difference we uh, saw between uh, childless females and males and uh, parents for both gender, but specifically for women, as we expected, and also uh, for, for Black uh, mothers. So we were trying to do something uh, to alleviate the impact the pandemic is going to have in our students, our graduate students remain in their programs and not leave because of the pandemic. So we tried to do something. One of, main, uh, of our main constraints here in Brazil is that we don't have funding for anything uh, uh, in our movement. The Parenting Science is a nonprofit uh, movement. We don't have any kind, any resource. So we decided to try to crowdfunding a program that we call Tomorrow. The idea is to build today the leaders of tomorrow. And it was really, really special to see how um, big our community, our 
supporters, uh, how many supporters we have, because through crowdfunding, we were able to raise over a hundred thousand uh, reais. Uh, and with this money, we are now supporting 26 students, grad students with this 700 reais a month uh, from April of the, this year until they finish their course. Uh, all these students are black graduate students, they are mothers. We also have indigenous students that are being uh, sponsored by our program. Uh, most of these students are solo mothers, so they do have an overload uh, in their duties with uh, child care and everything. So it was really important for us to start this program here. And we're really happy that we are making a difference, at least at these 26 students' lives. We had more than 700 applications uh, in the program, so that makes really clear that uh, it's a demand that is really urgent. So we were hoping that our funding agencies and our institutions will start to consider creating, uh, creating some kind of uh, program similar to the tomorrow. We are also working on expanding our uh, movement. So we have now one new chapter uh, in Latin America. So we have the Parenting Science Colombia that is run by Lina, that is uh, chairing this, uh, this section. Uh, it's really important for us, this, this expansion, because uh, even though we are neighbor countries and everything, we do have a different realities. Uh, and, Brazil is not a role model for uh, gender equality, but it's still, we have had some programs here in Brazil. And then uh, we are trying to contribute with our fellows in Colombia to start talking about this issue there and to, uh, start to promoting uh, changes. So Lina is running the service there right now in order to raise data on what happens when Colombian scientists have children. Uh, and then we can start to promote uh, the development of supportive policies there too. So I wanna leave uh, all the contacts. We are on all social media. You can find us in uh, just looking at parenting science. So we have our website. Uh, there is a tab in English there. You can have some information about our, our movement and we have our email here and for anything. And I guess that's it, Lina. Thanks a lot, Fernanda. I think it's wonderful. I repeat, repeat, but I really love this movement because, like you say, it is important for expanding in other countries in Latin America. Um, I have I have one question for Mariana Gilardi. Hi, Dr. Fernanda. Thank you so much for this amazing talk. How scientists that do not, that do not have children can support the parent science community? Okay, so one thing that is really important for us to talk about is that when we are talking about parenthood and anything, it, it cannot only be uh, a matter for uh, mothers. So we need the engagement of all the community so, in, so we can have any actual change. So what scientists that do not have children can do to support us is to engage in the discussion and leave doors open so we can talk in our institutions and then oh, funding agencies or anywhere about this subject. Um, that's the main thing, we need to open doors so people that are engaged in this discussion can present the demands, present the data, raise the subject, they raise the discussion. Uh, one other thing that is really important is to understand that we are not demanding any uh, privilege. We have a lot of this uh, feedback saying, oh, you want a special condition because you decided to be a mother. So I guess this comes usually from people that do not have children. We are not uh, requesting any uh, privilege, mm -hmm. but we need to understand that parenting uh, is not an individual thing. It's a collective thing. All this society should be engaged uh, mm -hmm. in raising our children. So I guess this is the main thing we have to understand that we are just trying to uh, level the field when we are competing. Science became a really important, uh, a really competitive space because uh, we are always talking about productivity. We have an issue when we say, uh, when we are just looking at numbers and today science became a little bit of that. 
a little bit of, um, we are always worried about how many papers I, am I publishing and when we should be worrying what's the difference I'm making in the world. So uh, it's a really uh, particular environment. So I, I think that's the way to support, to understand what's happening when you listen to people that has been uh, involved in, has, has gone through motherhood and parenthood or, uh, mm -hmm. or anything. So I guess this, that's the main thing to be open to listen and to learn and to help in whatever is uh, you can do about. Uh, we have an issue and it's not only here in Brazil is that women, especially mothers are not at decision-making places, spaces. So mm -hmm. people that are there, they should be supporting our demands and everything. So I guess that's, that's how you can support our, our movement and the actual mothers in science uh, demands and everything. <laughs> Thank you, Fernanda. Eh, aquí ten más un comentario de que una pregunta más yo quiero compartir. Dice, obrigada Fernanda, palestra maravillosa y súper importante. Acompaño el proyecto de Parent in Science y es un proyecto súper lindo, importante y necesario. Admiración por todo lo que ustedes están haciendo. <laughs> Obrigada, Maria Duapa. Uh, <laughs> I guess one main thing we have made difference other than bringing data, uh, trying to develop support policies and everything, I guess we were able to give some comfort to mothers everywhere because mm -hmm. we show that it's not an individual problem, it's like a structural problem. So we got a lot of uh, feedback from uh, mothers saying that they found some relief knowing that they were not alone. Então, não estamos sozinhas. <laughs> é isso. <laughs> yes, I have uh, one question, or I don't know, but uh, it seems that the problem is uh, the discussion about the children, but we don't know how to start talking about the justice, um, no, no sé, reproductive justice, equity, and addressing these racial disparities, and how we... Uh, try to talk this in our institutions in Latin America. That is a discussion that we need really start. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, we talk about uh, science and, and academia because it's where we are. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. talk about mothers in science, but mm -hmm. it's a really more general discussion that mm -hmm. we need as a society, how we see motherhood, how we see uh, parenthood as a whole. So. It's a really deeper conversation that we need to have, but when always when we are talking about uh, cultural or social change, that takes time, and mm -hmm. we cannot wait any longer. Because uh, when we look at the numbers here in Brazil about uh, women participation in science, mm -hmm. especially in leadership uh, positions, the numbers doesn't change for a decade or more. So mm -hmm. we cannot just wait for a cultural or social change. We need to ensure through policies that we are gonna get this change. But in the end, what we need is that society start to see that uh, having children and raising these children is not a women obligation. It's, a, it's everyone's obligation. So. <laughs> yes, yes, the situation. Um, another aspect that I think it's important and I, I, I want to, uh, can you speak about this, is about these aspects of evaluation criteria that I, I really think that with this data is very important because it's like we have the data and it's, it's like we need really have some criteria to evaluation this, this woman. And then how is the situation in Brazil and how this data can help for this uh, situation? So we really need to discuss about productivity in science, mm -hmm. because as I said, we are really focused on number, numbers much more than impact, but <laughs> it's the reality we have here yes. now. So what you are trying to do is to uh, make a little be uh, fairer the comparison of CVs. And that's why we implemented and we are requesting that our institutions and funding agencies uh, implement this maternity clause because mm -hmm. you cannot just look uh, at two CVs if one is a mother and the other is not uh, and think that's the same thing. It's not. So mm -hmm. 
we are trying to. And one thing we need now, uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, the first um, call that presented the maternity clause was in 2018. Mm -hmm. So what we need now is to evaluate that if that was affected, if uh, expanding the period of time we are looking at the CV or using the correction factor, if that actually made a change. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to gather data now. Uh, it's not really easy because uh, a lot of the information, they are not released by the funding agencies or the institutions. Uh, we have now in Brazil a new uh, law for data protection mm -hmm. that makes everything even more complicated. Mm -hmm. For instance, none of the agencies can release data uh, with ratio, uh, uh, with race, uh, mm -hmm. analysis, they are not allowed to do, uh, to release this information. So it's quite hard, but that's mm -hmm. what we need. Uh, we need to analyze the, what we had now, the maternity clause, the way it is, uh, mm -hmm. it's making a difference. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Then my my pregunta da Maria Eduarda de Andrade Borges. Eu sempre fico pensando nos eventos científicos como congressos, poucos têm espaços para crianças, o que pode limitar a participação de cientistas que apresentam eh, filhos e filhas. Como mostrar a importância desses espaços para quem organiza os eventos? Ah, então, essa é uma demanda antiga do Parenting Science. Né? A gente, desde, em 2018, a gente teve nosso primeiro evento, né? o Simpósio Brasileiro de Maternidade e Ciência, né? e a gente deu ofereceu a recriação. Né? Então, uh, é extremamente importante duas coisas. Né? Primeiro, a gente uh, naturalizar a presença de crianças nesses ambientes, o que a gente não faz. Né? Não é normal ver uma criança correndo no corredor de, um, de uma universidade, muito menos de um evento científico. Então, a gente precisa naturalizar a presença de crianças nesse, nesse ambiente, porque a gente precisa deixar muito claro que não ter crianças nesse ambiente significa, na vasta maioria das vezes, excluir as mães desses uhum. ambientes, não excluir os pais, né? Então, existe essa questão de gênero. Então, é muito, muito, muito importante né, apresentar essa demanda de uma maneira clara, de que existe um impacto na participação das mulheres nesses eventos se a gente não oferecer esse tipo de serviço. Uma uhum. maneira que a gente tem né, sugerido de fazer é fazer um levantamento. Então, ah, vai ter um evento da Sociedade Brasileira de, uh, de Evolução Sistemática, se é o nome da Sociedade de Evolução. Uhum. <risos> ah, claro, a gente está falando disso de evento presencial, né, gente? Uhum. Parece a nossa realidade, mas enfim, faz um levantamento. Né? Quantas pessoas vão participar desse evento? É um evento gigantesco, tem milhares de inscritos. Né? Se uh, esse evento né, não contar com recreação, quantas pessoas vão deixar de uhum. participar? Então, essa demanda anterior, né, mandar um e-mail para os sócios da sociedade, para as pessoas né, que participam da, desses eventos, para entender. Ah, né? existe a necessidade de oferecimento de, de recreação no evento, se isso for pago é ok, ou a pessoa só vai poder participar se for um serviço gratuito. Então, a gente criou um guia, está lá no nosso site, com algumas ideias de como vender né? essa, uh, uhum. essa ideia para os organizadores de eventos. Existe um custo, a gente sabe que existe esse custo, mas existem maneiras, principalmente em eventos de sociedades grandes, que são patrocinadas por empresas né, científicas, por editoras, enfim, existe uma maneira. Né? A gente uhum. dá a sugestão de parcerias com instituições de ensino que podem usar os alunos, né, projeto de extensão das nossas universidades. Então, existem alternativas. Né? Mas a primeira coisa vai ser mostrar a demanda de que ela existe e que vai fazer diferença em quem vai participar daquele, daquele evento. Uhum. Muito obrigada, Fernanda. Eu realmente acho aquela iniciativa super importante e que mesmo nós, como cientistas, podemos, nos eventos, começar a trabalhar nisso, não? mas poucas vezes, pelo menos é, para nós na Colômbia, até agora vamos começar, mas é mesmo pelo que apre conseguimos aprender com o movimento de vocês, conseguimos fazer as traduções de todas as guias que vocês já fizeram, então é isso, são, eu acredito para os países da Latinoamérica são esses primeiros passos, não? de nos apoiar, de olhar o que já estão fazendo os outros grupos e tentar isso, olhar para, para nossos contextos nos países o que a gente consegue mesmo fazer, então eu aproveito para te agradecer porque realmente é um material do Fine Science Brasil que, que nós estamos começando a utilizar nos eventos da, da Colômbia. Maria Eduarda, 
que fez aquela pergunta, disse que é super de acordo e que é muito obrigada por isso. É, aqui, a Cario Cania, ela diz, palestra espectacular, parabéns e a comunidade científica com certeza agradece e fica motivada com essas informações. Aqui, a Mariana Gilarte tem uma pergunta, did the brain science community throw of actions to take the race issue that is well found on your survey? That issue is really, really hard to tackle because when mm -hmm. we are talking about motherhood, we can raise, uh, we, we can develop uh, a policy that is really clear showing that we use a correction factor to uh, mm -hmm. equilibrate the publication records and everything. So that's easier to solve because uh, the ratio, the race issue we have is, mm -hmm. is really deeper than that. So it's kind of hard to tackle because that is really, really dependent on, first of all, uh, we, we are acknowledging that academy and science, not only in Brazil, but especially here in Brazil, is really racist. So we won't be able to do anything and change anything unless we do acknowledge that. So that's one of the main ob obstacles we have here because we say, no, that is not true. It's only exceptions we are talking about and we know it, it's not. Yeah, mm -hmm. So, uh, um, one thing that is necessary yeah, is to somehow improve, increase the number of uh, Black people in academia. So here in our university, Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, mm -hmm. the one I'm, I'm uh, working on uh, now, uh, we have now a new uh, legislation about how hiring process, mm -hmm. and they have uh, established a lot of affirmative actions uh, considering race. So we have um, a number of spots that are reserved for mm -hmm. Black people. Uh, and also they are adopting a correction factor on the CV analysis for Black people as well. So that is one main thing that is really important. We need to, uh, to acknowledge there are uh, barriers uh, mm -hmm. in the academic system that are not related to individual uh, ability or competence. And uh, it's, it's structural barriers that Black people face. So I guess that's one way to tackle the issue uh, in a more uh, now way, uh, using this kind of policy too. But it's, it's really hard. It's not easy to find, so to fight. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Um, and now, eu, eu tenho assim uma pergunta que talvez eu não tenha feito para ti, depois de todas as palestras que, que temos até compartilhado, mas é mesmo de, de, para nós que, por exemplo, eu estou na, no início da carreira, é, ainda é bem difícil me, me projetar ou pensar em continuar muitas vezes, e eu queria saber como desde tua experiência já como professora, mas mesmo que conhecer tu, tua experiência pessoal que levou e motivou para fazer esse movimento, é, como alguns conselhos de como nós é, mesmo sendo cientistas, mulheres mais na Latinoamérica, podemos realmente conciliar a carreira, não? A, a maternidade e a, e a carreira científica, mas também cuidando de nós, não? porque aquela coisa de como não pensar sempre em produtividade, em ascender na carreira, mas como é importante para ti, desde a tua experiência, é, que nós comecemos também a pensar no nosso cuidado. Sim, é, isso é fundamental. Né? Eu, eu, eu falo muito da minha experiência pessoal, é, então, a gente vive nesse ambiente altamente produtivista e altamente competitivo, e isso tem um desgaste emocional muito grande, uh, que não é só das mães. Né? Uhum. A gente tem aqui no Brasil níveis alarmantes de alunos de pós-graduação com problemas de uhum. saúde mental. Uhum. Né? A gente tem enfrentado isso já faz algum número de anos. Então, a academia, a ciência como um todo, precisa discutir essa questão do cuidado da nossa saúde uhum. mental, que isso não é sinal de fraqueza, a gente tem essa associação, né, de que, ah, então, né, eu já ouvi isso de colegas, de que, ah, a carreira na ciência não é para qualquer um, uhum. né, e na verdade, a gente precisa mudar urgentemente esse discurso. Então, algumas coisas que me ajudaram, né, foi entender isso, primeiro, né, que se eu tive uma mudança na minha dinâmica por causa da maternidade, e isso não foi aceito dentro da academia, no sentido de eu não ser mais produtiva da maneira que eles esperavam, que isso não era uma questão individual, que não era um problema meu, 
Não era eu que não conseguia dar conta, mas sim que o sistema não está preparado né? e não me deixa uh, seguir na minha carreira da maneira que eu posso naquele momento. Né? Então, acho que a primeira coisa é ter essa consciência, né? que de maneira nenhuma, se a gente está enfrentando né, dificuldades nessa conciliação ou questionando a nossa cap capacidade né, de, de seguir na ciência, de maneira nenhuma isso é uma questão individual. Né? Isso é uma questão estrutural. Né? A gente precisa nessa mudança. Então, o que fez muita diferença para mim, eu acho que é preciso né, as pessoas entenderem, é isso. Né? Que a gente não está sozinha nisso, não sou só eu que estou passando por isso. Eu acho que essa foi uma das grandes importâncias do Parenting Science, de trazer essa discussão. Né? As outras coisas né, de, de conselhos, é super difícil dar, dar, dar conselhos, <risos> né? Uh, mas é assim, ó, não tem como a gente né, sempre volta para aqueles conceitos que a gente uh, cria, né, da super mulher, né, aquela mulher que consegue ser mãe profissional, esposa, todas as faces que se espera de uma mulher de maneira exemplar. Né, a gente se cobra muito por isso. Então, acho que o, o meu outro conselho é tentar entender que não, não tem como, gente, não tem. Aquela imagem da super heroína que nos vendem, ela não existe, tá? Essa super heroína não existe. Existe uma mulher que possivelmente está sobrecarregada e vai sofrer né, alguma consequência dessa sobrecarga em relação à sua saúde mental e até mesmo física. Né? Então, acho que é, é entender, né? E de resto é se engajar na luta, gente. É, as mudanças e as, os avanços, as melhorias não vêm de graça, infelizmente. Elas não vêm de cima para baixo como deveriam vir. Né, as pessoas que estão lá tomando decisões deveriam estar olhando né, para as mudanças que são necessárias, mas não é isso que acontece. Então, esse engajamento é, 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 é o essencial. Né? E nessa militância, nessa luta, a gente conhece pessoas fantásticas. Né? Eu tenho essa sorte de ter conhecido muita gente que fez muita diferença na minha vida pessoal, né? ah, enquanto ah, parte do Parenting Science. Né? A Lina está incluída né, nessas pessoas. <risos> Né? Então, eu acho que é isso, gente, é ter essa consciência, né, de que a gente não tá sozinho, não é só a gente, né, e que juntos a gente vai conseguir fazer alguma mudança. <risos> Ótimo, Fernanda, muito obrigada. Eu lembro se vocês tiverem perguntas em português, o é, Dr. Fernanda Khan speak in English, é, mas, por enquanto, eu queria para tomar a, a, a última que vem mais sobre os retos, oportunidades e o que falta por fazer. Eu queria compartilhar aqui um curto texto que tinha ao início, que eu falei e esqueci de ler, que era sobre, sobre este simpósio. Then I want to share a, a short information about this symposium and to talk after with Fernanda about this. And is, uh, this is our lead symposium, Diversity and Inclusion in STEAM, how do we move from theory to practice? Then diverse perspectives are important for scientific research and innovation, yet there is a lack of diversity and an underrepresentation of minority groups across the scientific field. The ISB meeting has focused on breaking down the systematic barriers that limit the advancing equity and participation of women and minorities in STEAM. This symposium will assess where we stand and how we can achieve when, uh, gender equity and more diversity in STEAM disciplines. The intersection of gender equity with issues surrounding race and sexual orientation will be explored. We'll, we all need to become advocates of marginalized scientists and give them equitable opportunities to advance their careers. We aim to inspire, engage, and empower any individual considering a career team. Despite the advances in the LGBTQAI plus five, this is a good time to remember that there is still a long way to go. Also, lessons learned from this pandemic crisis should be used as a stepping stone to create systematic change and for rebuilding the, the world culture uh, in STEM fields. And then is that we like to discuss here the, the discussion about this symposium. And now I we want to talk for uh, the finish. What do you think about this situation uh, uh, from the pandemic crisis? and how we really need to uh, advance uh, in the, in, and help really for all people stay in academy.
sorry always happens <laughs> no problem <laughs> yeah, sorry um so uh there is no doubt the pandemic will be a setback mm -hmm. in a lot of our uh achievements uh regarding gender race and all the uh equality mm -hmm. we need in, in in science in order to have uh, diversity so what we need is to address these issues we cannot not only uh, we have a lot of data already showing that women are producing, uh, uh, publishing less uh, uh, papers, and uh, women are the ones that are being more impacted. Uh, there is an intersection with race and everything. So there is a lot of data now. We, we can no longer argue that there isn't uh, uh, a, a differential uh, effect, impact of the pandemic. So what we need is to act. We need to... Uh -huh uh adopt some of our recommendations we had in brazil to adapt these recommendations to the reality in different countries or regions or anything but we need to do something and i, I guess that's that's the main thing we can no longer think that uh, when the pandemic's over and we don't know when, when that's gonna be um things will be back to normal just like that there will be a long lasting effects of the pandemic and we need to do something we need to change roles, we need to adopt uh, specific policies, we need to support the groups that were more affected. And I, I guess that's key for we don't, so we don't have a lot of uh, setbacks in, in whatever we have achieved. <laughs> okay, then thank you very much, Fernanda. Well, time is running up and <laughs> we need to close this conversation, but we need to continue with the, another thought. And if you miss it, the screen of Pictura Scientist, you can now watch in Netflix. And we highly recommend this field. And really, thank you, thank you very much, Fernanda. And, and estamos na luta. Ahí, para continuar la América Latina. Obrigada, Fernanda. Muito obrigada. Chao, gente. Chao.